So now it's a great pleasure to introduce the next panel and our moderator. The panel is Rare Diseases. And as a leading company in rare diseases, it's an area for which I also, as a medical geneticist, seeing patients with these rare diseases over my clinical career, have a great passion for. And with 7,000 rare diseases and 400 million people across the world affected by one of these rare diseases. In fact, rare is not so rare with 5% of our population having one of these diseases. 80% of them are genetic. And unfortunately, we only have therapies for 5%. So that means 95% of patients who walk around with a rare disease are untreated. 50% of these are kids and 30% of these individuals fail to live beyond uh, their childhood years. It's a really um, sad area, but it's an exciting area. If you actually combine specialty and rare diseases, about 50% of the investment, 50, 50% of the R&D investment in our industry is targeting these diseases, diseases that for which only 2% of patients take medicine. So there's great hope for the future. And with that said, it gives me a great privilege to introduce the moderator of this panel, uh, an old friend and the chief scientist at Biogen, um, if there's anybody of all the great people and all the famous people and brilliant scientists that we have today, if there's anybody that doesn't need an introduction given the events of the last four to eight weeks, it's, it's Al Sandrock. And I'll say that, um, that it's been great to see the dialogue that's ensued with this approval of aducanumab and however you feel about this approval, whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it, however you feel, no one could argue to the great passion and advocacy that Al has brought to the table. And he's championed really what he believes in. So Al, going from a common disease now to rare diseases, I'll hand the panel over to you. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you for your kind introduction. I have a fantastic panel. Um, and uh, I, and uh, I'm so excited to get going on this discussion. You have their bios, uh, but I think you'll agree that they are fantastic. Um, and I also have two additional people who are going to help me with questions as well, Lena and Tim. Uh, and so let me get started. Um, I want to start with the patient and, uh, uh, and ask Majid to start with, you know, uh, he's the founder of the Lulu Foundation. And what got you, what prompted you to start the foundation? And what would you have to say to the people in the audience here and the folks on the panel in terms of uh, the patient perspective. Thanks, Al, and great to be here. And a big thanks to Karun and, and Andy for making it happen. So I'll just give you a, a quick summary of our seven-year odyssey, just because it's quite representative of, of many rare disease patient odysseys. So just over seven years ago, our eldest daughter, Alia, was born, was born totally healthy. And then 10 days later, she had 10 seizures. And we went through a diagnostic odyssey that took many months and were finally diagnosed with CDKL5 deficiency disorder, which is a rare neurogenetic disorder causing epilepsy and, and developmental uh, delays. And I remember at the time, uh, you know, we were distraught. We were in the hospital, my wife and, and myself. And, and uh, I said, look, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have even known what was wrong. Uh, and, and 10 years from now, hopefully this will be a treatable disorder along with many others. And, and she said, I want to be 10 years from now. And uh, I said, well, we are the generation of humanity that needs to get from the knowledge of the genomic age that, that is already there to the, the ability to implement that therapeutically. Uh, so we launched the Lulu Foundation and... Um, with clear goals. And I think that's an important first lesson. You have to set your goals. And, and we set treatments in five years, symptomatic treatments and cures, plural, quote unquote, within 10 years. And that was back in 2015. Um, and I think our, our objective was really kind of laser focused on how to de-risk our indication for industry. We quickly realized that actually it's industry that makes, uh, that makes the, the drugs, but what do they need? And the three elements that we've focused on, which I'll just summarize. The first is building a patient community, uh, a one of partnership, one that's cohesive. So when, when Alia was born, we were told there were a few hundred patients in the world. We now know many thousand. The incidence rates now well defined at one in 42,000. So it's actually tens of thousands of patients potentially. But then we have a global alliance of patient groups, over 20 now, 
Uh, and we really built on some of the excellent work they did. But we learned from, from other indications the importance of remaining uh, united and cohesive. The second step was funding the science. And we have a, a grant program. And we partner with the Orphan Disease Center at, at the University of Pennsylvania, who helps us implement that. And our CSO is based there. Um, but also building the toolkit in parallel. So that might be the models, whether it's cellular models, uh, better animal uh, models, also the clinical infrastructure, best, better patient registry, an endpoint uh, study, an ICD-10 code, uh, educating the regulators on uh, what this disease uh, is, uh, both the FDA and the EMAs. Uh, and, and the third one is engagement in parallel. So the, the old idea, which has never really been true anyway, that you need to first work on the science and then engage with industry down the line once you get more answers. I don't think that's true of any disorder, really, but it's certainly not true in rare disease. So we, we um, took the decision to engage early and often with industry, with the regulators. We have a symposium we host, an online app to keep uh, scientists connected. So today, um, there's a better biological understanding. We have the, the toolkit. We've had multiple trials. Uh, still no approved uh, a drug, but uh, hopefully soon. But we also have exciting proofs of concept preclinically of mice uh, that have had the condition reversed with gene therapy and also some theoretical transgenic uh, approaches. But we've always seen that, you know, ultimately our customer is industry. Uh, but what do we need to bring together to make it happen? Thank you, Majid. That's very compelling. Um, uh, beautifully articulated the ecosystem that you figured out how to navigate, essentially. And I think what you just uh, said for the Lulu Foundation applies to many, many other rare diseases. It's very similar to what I heard from the SMA Foundation in the early days as well. Um, and so thank you very much for that. I'd like to ask each panelist, you know, um, Majid mentioned the revolution in genomic medicine, and Andy did too, but what, what has enabled us to, to actually tackle rare diseases from the technology uh, point of view? Uh, maybe I'll start, and then maybe you can list some of the successes as well. Um, so I'll start with Kathy. Well, thanks, Al. Uh, and I, I think I would name as a, a critical foundation, uh, scientifically, the Human Genome Project and the ability to identify the genes uh, that cause so many of these uh, rare diseases. And I think part of the hope of the Human Genome Project had been that, uh, that by identifying these diseases, we would greatly expand therapeutic options for people born with uh, serious inherited diseases. And uh, I, at least part of that hope had also centered on gene therapy. And of course, as you know, in the, uh, in the event, it took a good deal longer to work out uh, successful gene therapy than it did to uh, sequence the human genome. Uh, but I do think that now with a handful of approved products uh, for serious genetic diseases, approved gene therapy products for serious genetic diseases, what seems especially exciting to me is that over the last couple of years, we've begun to hear about very promising data in late phase clinical trials for what I would call the more common rare diseases, for example, sickle cell disease, uh, thalassemia, hemophilia, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so some of these diseases that really affect uh, very large numbers of people uh, are in phase three testing with promising results. And so I think we are poised to move from gene therapy as a treatment for a handful of ultra rare disorders, pediatric neurodegenerative diseases, uh, inherited retinal dystrophies and so forth to more common uh, inherited diseases. And so I see that as a, a, a sign of progress for the field. Thank you, Kathy. Frank, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I would add uh, to what Kathy said. I think the Human Genome Project was really a, a, a landmark for uh, giving us the encyclopedia of, of, of the human genome and, and the genes. And, and I think another really important technology events that, that's enabled us to uh, be where we are today is the sequencing technologies. I, I think uh, it's amazing today that uh, 
uh, we can sequence a person's genome for a few thousand dollars. Um, and that gives us uh, a tremendous amount of information and has probably you know, been watershed in our ability to, di to diagnose these uh, rare diseases. And you know, the implementation of that is, is, I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg as far as seeing what, uh, what we can do with that. And my hope is that uh, that, that would lead to newborn screen, uh, you know, sequencing basically at birth so that we can treat patients prophylactically rather than treating them, you know, after they have symptoms onsets. Uh, um, and then, you know, the other uh, aspect is, uh, you know, uh, drug discovery technologies. And, and, you know, my field has been in uh, antisense oligonucleotides and, um, you know, the, the sequence uh, information has been critical for us to really leverage the uh, technology that we've been working on for 30 years and applying it now to these uh, rare diseases. And as you know, we're, we're beginning to see some success come out of that uh, uh, that effort there. Thanks, Frank. Uh, John and David, do you have anything to add in terms of what has enabled us to tackle rare diseases? Yeah, I would just add, um, Al, in addition to the um, new technologies and sequencing of the human genome, and which has clearly accelerated our understanding of the biology and therefore new targets in, in rare disease, um, I'd like to highlight the Orphan Drug Act itself because that was really revolutionary in terms of the investment and in, uh, creating incentives for developing new therapies. Prior to its authorization in 1983, there were only or less than 10 therapies actually that had come to market. Since its approval in 1983 to the end of 2020, we've had 599 orphan products uh, developed and approved to treat rare diseases. So that's absolutely tremendous. And it's interesting that over the past 15 years, Big Pharma has really jumped into the fray. Uh, they're a dominant force in this sector right now, uh, clearly for various reasons, including addressing their uh, pipelines and generic competition. Thanks, John. David? Yeah, Al, the only thing I would add is uh, non-scientific, but the internet. and. Uh, Again, it's uh, enabled many things, but um, you know, with all this amazing science and uh, ability to diagnose, understand the biology, um, the challenge for many of these communities is, th is that they're just not organized and they're too small. So whether you're the patient being diagnosed and you're suddenly alone and you know who do you talk to, how do you get information, whatever, that's all been enabled. And importantly, from a clinical development standpoint, um, as many conversations with patient organizations, if you can do anything to increase your chance of having a cure, it's organize yourself and the internet's been foundational to that. Thanks, David. Well, one thing that uh, was sort of was touched on but not really talked about was prices, drug prices. And, um, uh, uh, you know, each one of you in the industry are aware of this, but how important is that to enable this or to continue to sustain it? And are there any clouds on the horizon that you'd like to highlight that may impede our progress? Uh, you know, we talk, talked about successes, but is this assured, is this sustainable? Um, who wants to start? <laughs> David? Maybe I'll, I'll dive in. I, I think I flagged that up early. I mean, we all, I think we're all concerned about this. Um, you know, it's under the sustainability of the model. And, and if you go back to the uh, early 90s, Genzyme being uh, one of the pioneers here, um, at that point when we were discussing, you know, the treatment for Gaucher, that one of the first uh, rare disease treatments that came forward, it was a price at a very high level, um, you know, for the world, it was, you know, sort of unbelievable. How could that work? But society really embraced that. Um, they they understood understood that the pricing was a function of rarity that, um, you know, if there wasn't a price um, that allowed a company to recover on the work that went into it and acknowledging there's a very small number of individuals who might benefit, um, in a sense, society had to step up. So um, the foundation was laid there, but we've, we've come a long way. And I think it's, um, you know, this, this model, it's not guaranteed, it's not magic. And increasingly, the rules around rare diseases are the same as, you know, the rules elsewhere, meaning that um, we have to demonstrate value. Um, there has to be clear value. Just because you have a treatment for a rare disease doesn't mean that you should be, you know, reimbursed. It's what is the value you have created for that individual patient or that um, individual um, community. Um, the second thing I think we, we need to be thoughtful about is industry pricing in general. Um, I think from an industry perspective, 
there's this societal contract which says, yes, you're going to pay more for the drug when it's first approved and over its patent life, but then it will go off patent. And you, society, we will all have that drug for a fraction of the cost forevermore. And I think in the rare disease world, that evolution hasn't fully played out in part because many of these are biologics and they have their own challenges in terms of going generic. But I think as a community, we have to think about how do we fulfill our side of that societal contract that says you're going to pay more in the beginning, but it's not a, a lifetime contract at that same price. That's a really good Alex, I, Yeah, go ahead. Alex, I could just jump, yeah, jump in here and just add something to what David said. Um, you know, I do think as a society, we have a challenge here. Um, if we applied the current model to the remaining 7,000 or so rare diseases, that still have no treatment, we'd have a big problem um, because healthcare budgets are finite and we're already experiencing some challenges with pricing and market access. So we need to come up with um, innovative market access solutions and maybe that involves some kind of public-private partnerships that takes the onus off the private sector entirely uh, or par partially, but that also keeps the incentives for developing new therapies for rare disease. And the model for gene therapies is of course evolving rapidly um, but we shouldn't apply traditional or outdated approaches to assess the value there. The most important distinction here being that gene or cell therapies or other regenerative therapies are intended to be given as a, as a one-time treatment with long-term benefits versus the traditional chronic therapy that requires recurrent payments. So the value of these new one-time therapies needs to be demonstrated using non-traditional approaches. So standard cost-effectiveness frameworks don't fairly represent the overall value of these treatments. Thanks, John. Before we move on to the next question, I wondered if Majid had a patient perspective on what we just talked about. Yeah, so I, I totally agree uh, with John's point. There does need to be uh, innovation. I'll, I'll take it away from, from the paying side and, uh, to um, the approval process and the regulatory side. Uh, I just think that the way the trial design and, and the hurdles, certainly efficacy still has to be um, proven up. But the way it's done for smaller populations like rare diseases just has to be different. It, it, it's too much of a burden now relative to the population size. And that's what drives the cost up, which ultimately uh, affects the price. Uh, and, and of course, the time uh, to uh, development. The other thing I would add is, I think with some of these new technologies, gene therapy, uh, gene editing, there are some common infrastructure uh, needs which government can step into. It's starting to, there's an NIH initiative that was announced a couple of years ago, um, but beyond just sort of vector manufacture, actually trying to crack the nut of delivery into key organ systems. Uh, once you've done it overall, then hopefully it's not gonna be quite as straightforward as plug and play, but you will see an acceleration of progress for multiple indications. So there are some areas where uh, government spending can really move the needle quickly, as we've seen it can uh, with COVID-19. Thank you very much. I wanna uh, now move on to ultra rare diseases. And I'm gonna, even though Tim is here to be a questioner, I'm gonna also treat him sort of like a panelist. But, um, when, you know, we talked about rare diseases, but then we have the ultra rare and, you know, sort of the N of one, if you will, or the N of a few. Um, what are the issues associated with that? I'm going to ask Tim to start how he thinks about that as he practices medicine, but also how he approaches thinking about therapeutic, uh, therapeutics. And then maybe also ask Frank to talk about N. Lorem. Thanks, Alan. It's, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and, and to follow up all these distinguished uh, guests here. Um, I think that uh, as, as a geneticist and neurologist at Boston Children's, we get approached a lot uh, by uh, families, especially those uh, with disorders that no one has ever heard of that haven't made it to uh, perhaps the stage of having a foundation like Majid's, uh, that haven't made it to uh, the target profile uh, uh, portfolios of uh, companies like yours, Al, um, and uh, they're in that early stage of looking for looking for help, looking for scientists, and looking for industry partners. And I wanted to come back to the the, the 
uh, point that John made about public-private partnerships, that as we think about this long tail of ultra-rare diseases, and there are many, the, the great majority of the 7,000 different genetic diseases uh, have incredibly tiny populations. Um, how do we see, uh, it's clear that the, the populations are so small, the patients that are coming to us often uh, will tell us that there may be only three or four other patients like them that, that their doctors are aware of in the world. And so how do we incentivize uh, the uh, activities of these public-private partnerships? Um, how do we band these groups together? What, what we try to connect a lot, a lot of these families to one another, um, and there's been ideas floated, for instance, by uh, Andrew Lowe at MIT of forming a national CRO to coalesce under an umbrella uh, many ultra-rare diseases. Do you see, how do you see that working uh, given that we have experts here who uh, have seen single disease efforts really well incentivized under their current system, how do, how do you imagine this working uh, under a larger umbrella organizations like that? John, I think he was asking you. Well, you know, I, I do think we need something like that, a, a framework that um, creates this umbrella so that we can sort of defray and share the cost in developing therapies for these ultra, ultra rare diseases. You know, at Alexion, we kind of, you know, some of this is related to pricing strategy. And, and um, when you are able to capture more patients in a particular platform, obviously you have a lot more flexibility on the pricing side. So that's the direction we've taken because there hasn't been something like this in place to incentivize us to go into those ultra, ultra rare conditions. So absolutely endorse the need for that. I don't exactly know what the solution is, but honestly, but it's something that we need to um, apply some effort to. Go ahead, Maybe, Frank. Yeah, so one thing to consider is, is how expensive it is to, to identify and, and, and develop a drug. And, you know, one area that we really haven't talked about is ways that we can increase the efficiency of the process. And, uh, um, you know, it's, you know, just the discovery of the, of the molecule that you're going to be using for a drug, it consumes teams of, of, of people to, uh, uh, to uh, partake in that. And, you know, one of the areas that we're really interested in is, is uh, really, you know, thinking about machine learning uh, technologies that we can really capitalize on past experiences to be able to make it a much more efficient uh, process for the discovery. That's just really the starting point. And, and I think everybody uh, on the panel recognizes that the discovery of the drug is actually the cheap part of the process and the expensive part is the, uh, the development and showing that it has clinical utility. And you know, I think that the point is that, we, you know, for these rare, ultra rare diseases, we, we need to think differently about how we're going to demonstrate uh, efficacy and, and, you know, maybe even go back to the, the a point where uh, we may not need to demonstrate efficacy. What we have to uh, demonstrate is no harm to the patient and, you know, or, or reframe how we're trying to approach uh, going forward uh, with the technology. And, and you know, uh, we, we have a, a foundation that our CEO, ex-CEO started Stan Crook called Inlorum Foundation. And we spent quite a bit of time thinking through um, this uh, issue about the benefit risk and how do we, you know, continue uh, patients where there may be just one patient on treatment and Tim's had to deal with this. How do you justify continuing to, to treat that patient with a, a medicine that could have some adverse effects and, and getting that balance right? and, and uh, I think those are the kinds of discussions we need to have to really advance the field and advance where we can treat uh, many more of these patients out there. Um, Al, one, one additional thought there, just, just to pile on here. I think the disease foundations and the patient advocacy organizations can do a lot to, to support um, drug development in rare disease more broadly, maybe not the ultra, ultra rare, um, but somewhere in between by creating disease registries that will bring a better understanding of the natural history and right. disease progression, because a lot of these diseases we don't really understand and, and we have to define uh, and refine clinical endpoints, PROs, that can serve as a basis for regulatory and approval and market access. And so um, there, there's a clear gap there that um, is, is quite a challenge for companies to pursue if that hasn't been, that groundwork hasn't been laid. That's a good point. Back, but you I'll could demonstrate. 
Sorry, David, did you want to say no, something? No, I just would, yeah, just one, one quick point. The, I just want to go back to, to Frank. Um, so the, the risk benefit issue, I think this is, you know, back to regulatory frameworks, we, we do think there's a bit of a cookie cutter and, you know, you you have to have, and Tim's already, you know, this standard, you know, expensive approach and Tim's already proven, well, that's not true. Um, you know, it can be done and risk benefit, of course, and, and small populations, you can think absolutely differently, right, about the overall risk benefits. So that's a key component. And the other thing I think about is for these ultra rare um, entities, it works if we can leverage something. And the question is, how do we incentivize the party that has something to leverage to allow it to be used? And so you can think of R&D tax credits and the like, right? Which is to say, you know, if I've got a technology, a delivery, Majid, you mentioned delivery is an issue, right? I mean, I might be a company that has, you know, I'm, I don't have anything to do with Rare, but I see that I could contribute to that. And if somebody told me I could get a significant tax credit, you know, in the, a line yeah. an R&D tax credit, I might throw my hat in the ring. Somebody else has got manufacturing expertise and, you know, they can devote a reactor and get a tax credit. I might do that. Yeah, and that's a, those are good points, David. It seems also that all these innovations in genomics and, and uh, in, in terms of therapeutic modalities, gene therapy, as Kathy pointed out, and oligonucleotides, as Frank did, um, and even potentially do efficacy type of studies with registry compar or comparisons to natural history. It's exposed some of the bottlenecks, though, one of the, I think, frankly, you, you were telling me that one of the most costly and time-consuming aspects is the preclinical safety. And there right. hasn't been major innovation in toxicology that I know of anyway, and maybe I just don't know, in a long time. And, uh, and I know that the FDA has put new guidelines in that has reduced some of the hurdles, but it still takes a long time and it's pretty costly. Yeah, you know, I mean, for in Lorem Foundation, that uh, you know, where we're trying to develop individual uh, therapies for for patients, uh, free of cost to the the, the patient. Uh, the most expensive part of the whole process is the IND or or the talk studies that would support treating uh, the individual patients. Um, and you know, as Al pointed out. Um, there really hasn't been any change from doing. Uh, you know, luckily the FDA has reduced it to a single species instead of having to do two species and, and they'll allow rodents for, for, for uh, the, you know, the single species, but you still have to do, um, you know, extensive uh, uh, tox work that adds cost to individual patients. And, uh, you know, we're getting to the point where patients are having, you know, bake cells to raise money for tox studies. And, and I know Tim's had to deal with that a bit as well. Uh, Thanks, Frank. You know, uh, we all, look, we only have five minutes left. It's amazing how quickly time flies. I wanted to ask Lena if there were some questions that she would want to ask the panelists at this point. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, our focus in TMA Precision Health, which is a company I'm representing here, which uh, we created um, based on our experience, because I'm a patient with a rare disease and, uh, and a scientist and an entrepreneur and all that. So, but something that, that I have... Um, realize is that yes 80 percent of rare diseases are monogenic and probably targeted therapies are going to be uh, good for those but there is something that we rarely think about and is that rare diseases and many of them are syndromes and they are pre they present with different uh, types and, and different uh, yeah the, the patients are confronted to different uh, development of the disease so what we are doing integrating now information you know and then basically what, what we can understand is analyze the patient journey and then identify the segment you know segment the patients and really understand how they move forward and how what are the patterns of disease presentation that are, uh, we can anticipate uh, how to control and better treat those patients and I think that we, we came to realize that information that we gather is crucial for drug development and, and for clinical utility, as uh, one of the panelists was mentioning. So um, what I want to raise here is the, the how can we use the, that information that companies like ours are gathering from the primary care before we actually go, you know, to the, to the uh, before the disease is totally identified, because we actually help as well to identify the disease and if there is a gene involved, etc. But what is most important is these patterns of presentation. And these patterns of presentation allow us to understand better diseases. Academics can do more work in terms of understand targets. And then pharma can do a better approach of patient to therapy rather than molecule to therapy. So 
I would like to sort of put that information on the table and get the discussion triggered from that. How can we use better that information in pharma? Precision phenotyping, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Frank touched on something that um, uh, uh, he talked about newborn screening, and he wondered whether that could really improve things, uh, accelerate this area. And, you know, we have only now just finally gotten the last few states to do newborn screening for spinal muscular atrophy, even though drugs have been available for years. Um, and that's sort of the catch-22, that, that you can't get newborn screening until you have a therapy. But I wonder whether, Frank, you were suggesting that you could accelerate this whole process if we had newborn screening uh, that was more comprehensive. And I wondered whether each of the panelists would have a, a view on that. You know, just one thought is, you know, as I mentioned, the sequencing costs are, are getting to the point where we can consider sequencing at, at birth uh, for every every baby born. And, you know, the issue that I think we struggle with is that there's a lot of uh, sequence information that's not actionable today, and, but yet the, the sequence isn't changing. And so maybe one way to approach this is that you have a, a book uh, with your sequence information in it. And every few years when there's scientific advances, you kind of go back into the book or your physician goes back into the book uh, uh, and uh, identifies maybe, you know, at this point you need to get more exercise or you need to eat, you know, change something in your lifestyle that could impact your health, you know, 20 or 30, 40, 50 years from now, um, uh, you know, as, you know, science advances. And, and it, it seems silly not to do you know, new uh, total genome sequencing rather than do a piecemeal uh, for only the, the diseases that are actionable today. Or, or maybe not, if not newborns, at least some systematic process whereby, right. for example, any unknown rare disease, any patient that presents with something that's unknown, perhaps right. should, should at least be considered for, for genetic testing or full yeah. May I just add, I think it's more related to natural history of the disease, what I'm mentioning, rather than pre-screening and genotyping everybody, especially for underserved communities that, you know, that's probably an impossibility <laughs> to get genotype everybody, but natural history is so important. So can, can we follow those patients, learn from it, and then try to better type rare diseases and then identify uh, target them? But you can combine the two where you're, you're collecting a rich natural history that, that's sort of tied to your, your genome history. Um, right. And, right. you know, I think that will be actionable at some point in the future. Right. And just to follow Probably up, on, uh, just to follow yes. up on Al's point uh, about uh, genome sequencing, uh, you know, I do think that in uh, pediatric genetics, people are moving to this more and more quickly to avoid the kind of diagnostic odyssey that Majid talked about for his daughter. Uh, and so I, you know, I think that's, that's not so far away. Uh, application to the entire population, you know, I'm not sure we're going to see that right away, but. Um, 23 and me. So, <laughs> so just, just, to, just to add to that, I mean, I totally agree, just our example, our disorder, you know, it used to be 10 years plus the age of diagnosis. In our case, it was about six months. Now it's a matter of weeks more and more. And there are more hospitals applying that, you know, any child into the NICU, they do the sequencing first before the whole odyssey. But uh, actually, Kathy, uh, the UK government this week is having a public debate on whether every newborn child should be sequenced. So uh, it's not that that's beyond the realm of the possible, but certainly every child with something clearly wrong uh, at birth, that's becoming far more straightforward and, yes. and, and usual. Thank you. Um, well, it's 1022. I don't know whether Andy and Karun are gonna let us keep talking because I think we could talk all day about this very exciting area. Um, uh, why, don't you take, why don't you end at 1025 and then we'll move on. Okay, all right, wonderful. Um, are there any, do you, in terms of gene therapy, um, Kathy, do you see any advances uh, that could sort of uh, replace um, the uh, current therapies? For example, I'm thinking about gene editing. 
Well, I think that uh, actually some of the results that are coming out from clinical studies using gene editing, and I would cite, for example, the sickle cell uh, results uh, from uh, CRISPR and others, uh, to me, are proving the, uh, uh, the worth of uh, gene editing approaches. And I think that base editing is not far behind. And I think that what will be important for people interested in gene-based therapeutics is to understand the best ways to combine and utilize uh, or choose among the options that we have and everything from uh, mRNA, antisense oligonucleotides, and gene replacement and gene knockdown to gene editing and base editing. And so I think uh, the proliferation of uh, gene-based strategies is only a good thing for uh, people with rare disease. Thanks, Kathy. I was thinking that, you know, there must be criteria to each company on which diseases to tackle and put into their pipeline. Uh, and, you know, for us at Biogen, for example, we have taken on SOD1 mediated ALS along with Ionis. Uh, even though only one or two percent of patients with ALS have it, we estimate the prevalence to be about 500 or so when we started the program in the U.S. Uh, Tim talked about the ultra rare, you know, the ends of one to five to ten that N. Lauren, I think, is tackling. Is there a gap in between the ultra rare and the 500 to 1,000 plus that we haven't addressed? Yes. I, think one of the, I think one of the age old um, beliefs about rare diseases was it was an entry point to larger diseases. I think, um, A, that may be true. I mean, you know, we may be able to apply a gene therapy to a rare disease and uh, run a maybe a quicker trial. I think that's a bit of a misnomer, but, um, but I do think that um, the expansion, um, so for example, Rhythm right now, the company I'm at, um, we're looking at rare genetic diseases of obesity. The first genes that we are studying, literally there's, you know, tens of people that we are um, pursuing for, the, you know, in the U.S. at the current time, but the number of genes that may be benefited is much larger. And so the whole research plan is to work through those different genes and try to understand that incremental opportunity. So um, I, I think a company has to decide, are they, are they in that disease and trying to pursue it to its natural end following the science, or are they in it to simply get to something else? And they're two different things. Yeah. Frank, so I, just, you, I just wanted to, 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 I'll just, uh, you know, uh, sort of a message of hope, as Andy said, that, you know, just five years ago when we started, none of these things were approved. And now we already have multiple approved uh, gene therapies as well as uh, for, for rare disorders such as your own for, for SMA. And even I remember that conversation with my wife being told that, you know, Alia was missing one letter from one copy of this gene. And she said, can't we put it back? And I said, honey, that's not how DNA works. And today we're actually working with a lab with prime editing to do precisely that. And, and the field has moved so far um, in just these few years. I think it, it is very exciting and hopeful. Well, on that positive note, it's past 1025. It begins and ends with the patient. Thank you very much, uh, Majid. And I want to thank all my panelists for a very uh, stimulating and uh, wonderful conversation. I'll turn it back over to Andy. Thank you very much, Alan. Thanks to all the panelists. And I'm going to hand this to Karun to kick off our polling. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Al. Uh, wonderful panel. Can you put the polling slide, please, for the rare diseases? Right. What measures are most needed to accelerate drug development in rare diseases? Paul starts. We have 50 seconds to Paul. Please go ahead. The question is, what measures are most needed to accelerate drug development in rare diseases? Next year, Karun, we'll need some elevator music during this one minute period. Yep. or the Jeopardy song. Exactly.
you know, toward them. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Thank you for participating in our polling. If we could pre please bring up the polling results so that we can share them with the audience. And I'm just going to bring this up on my screen so I can read it. There we go. Great. So the question that each of you addressed was what measures are most needed to accelerate drug development in rare diseases? And actually, I was suspecting that this one would be more even than the results have turned out. And it looks like uh, the majority and almost 50% of you polled believe that the um, most needed uh, activity is to more use of real world data from rare disease patients to understand natural history of disease and disease heterogeneity. So thank you very much for participating in that poll.